Uh, hello, one and all, and welcome to the Web EV Talk Series. This is a podcast uh, about extracellular vesicles. My name is Jan Lötval. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. I have worked on extracellular vesicles for about 15 years or so. And today, I am very happy to introduce Dave Carter, who is a professor at uh, Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom. And he's basically a molecular biologist who over the last many years now, have been interested in extracellular vesicles, participated in ICEV activities, and helped uh, get the first massive open online course uh, up and running as well. So, uh, Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got interested in vesicles, where you, where you come from. Okay, so uh, I, I've had my lab now for about uh, 10, 12 years. And, uh, and so originally I was interested in non-coding RNAs uh, and, and also the, uh, the bystander effects. So this is something I've been working on for quite a long time. So this is this idea that, that cells that are stressed can communicate with naive non-stressed cells to induce effects in these in, in surrounding cells. So, so I, was, I was really quite interested in that through collaboration uh, with, with a colleague at work, Professor Manira Kedem. And so um, we were interested in what the, the non-cutting RNA might be. We'd shown that an RNA molecule might be involved. And I went to a talk in Oxford and I saw somebody from Matthew Wood's lab um, present a talk about extracellular vesicles and, and I immediately straight away... Had you I heard about was, them before that? I'd not heard about them before I got complete. This was in 2011 wow. or so. And, That's and when this paper was talking, published, yeah. Yeah, I, remember I was sat next to my postdoc at that time and we turned to each other at that moment and I thought, oh, that, it's got to be vesicles, right? It's got to be vesicles. Although everyone was calling them <laughs> yeah. at the time. Uh, and so, yes. so we went back to the lab, we, we did some experiments, we tried them out and we found that they were involved uh, we think, we thought, uh, in our process and so in, in the bystander effects. And so uh, we, we published a paper back at 12 now. Uh, looking back at that paper, when you look at the MICE guidelines and stuff, I look at that paper and I think, oh, it wasn't Listen, great. listen, but, listen. Uh, I mean, we all <laughs> did papers that we would like to redo <laughs> yeah. sometimes, but, but it was reasonable at the time. The it technique you applied at, at the time was reasonable for those years. Ten years sure. later, there will. Ten years from now, there will be new techniques out there, right? So Absolutely. we got to live with the data as it is, right? No, but that's that's how we got into it. And and you're absolutely right. That at the time, it was the best we could do, and uh, so we we got into the field at that point. And so the more I read about exosomes and microvesicles and extracellular vesicles, the more I I fell in love with it. And and so I've been doing it ever since. And the lab now is all of the stuff that we do in the lab now. Pretty much all of the stuff we do in the lab. But not all of it, but most of it is to do with EVs, and so yeah, we, we're all trying to trying to push the methodology and, and 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 find out about EVs and how they work. And we're primarily interested in EV uptake, um, so that's something that we got into uh, more recently. And and also uh, we're interested in again in bystander effects and how cells communicate with each other using EVs, particularly during a stress response. And so what we found is that and there's different kinds of stress responses that will induce this effect and, and cause cells to effectively talk to one another during a stress response. And we think it's a way that cells, an adaptation that cells can use to, to help coordinate stress responses within perhaps a tissue. And so what we found is that a cell that's stressed will communicate with a non-stressed uh, cell and make that cell stressed as well, which seems kind of crazy, right? Because why would you want to do that to your to your neighbors, to your friends, mm -hmm. to your brothers and sisters? Why would you want to, to make them feel your pain? Uh, and it seems that um, in addition to the, the stress response occurring in those bystander cells, they also have an adaptive response. So although they seem stressed, there is a price to pay. They're actually harder to kill when you try and kill them. So we think there's a like an adaptive stress response going on. And, and it happens with different uh, types of, um, of stress. So we've got interested in, in, in exploring how that is also uh, affecting tumor cells, for example, during cancer right, progression. Right. You know, yeah. What are the potential implications there? And can, can there be some sort of therapeutic interventions? And, and what are the implications in you know, during therapy? So, um, so that's, that's the direction that we're going in. 
And we've recently got into uh, biomarkers as well, because I was really trying to avoid getting into biomarkers because it's such a big problem. It's hard not to be part of it, right? But it's, but it's just to say, uh, dwell a little bit on the, on the uh, uh, bystander effect, because yeah. not everybody knows exactly what that is. So, so the way I, I have a clinical, clinical background, we know that, for example, if you have multiple tumors in your body and you irradiate one of them, you can get an, a biological effect in a tumor that is far away and did not reach, you did not get treated by the radiation therapy. So that's what the clinicians call a, a bystander effect. And, yeah, and there are many types of bystander effects, I presume, right? So, yeah, so um, absolutely. So, so a lot of the a lot of the in vivo effects in in uh, in patients, the abscopal effects that you're describing. Um, I don't know how much has been done to sort of formalize that. A lot of it is sort of ad hoc kind of people know mm -hmm. that it, it happens, these field effects that you see in, in, in patients. Um, but you're absolutely right. There are different aspects to this. And, and many, many different cell types will undergo this bystander effect and, and many organisms also. So there's, there's quite a few people studying the, the effects in different organisms. So uh, for example, you can take a mouse and you can uh, put a, a lead coat on it and put its head into an irradiator, which seems like a, not a very nice experiment, but it's been done. Okay. Um, and so, and then you can irradiate mm -hmm. its head, and you will see DNA damage in lots of other parts of, of the uh, right uh, of the mass. And so, absolutely, that there, there is in vivo evidence for, for something that's going on. And, and if if it's occurring in different organisms with different cell types, then presumably there's an evolutionary reason why why it's come to be. So when when you're uh pursuing understanding of exocytic vesicle function, it seems you're working on cell biological technologies and trying to understand the fundamentals, not necessarily being driven by a disease-specific process, not colon cancer or, um, you know, right. multiple sclerosis or anything like that. It's just a general cell-mediated biology you're trying to understand. Yeah. So we've we've primarily been looking in breast cancer and in ovarian cancer, and you're absolutely right. We're more interested in the process rather than the the disease. Um, but more recently, we we have been getting more into different tumor types, and as I said, breast cancer and ovarian cancer in particular, and mm -hmm. how these effects can can uh, influence, let's say, drug resistance, um, mm -hmm. because we think that this bystander effect could be also potentially inducing drug resistance in ovarian cancer. So we have a, a, a paper on that showing that if you if you uh, inhibit EV mediated communication, then you can uh, affect the sensitivity of, or resistance of these cells during a stress response. So I think there are potential applications there, but but we were initially yeah, we were initially interested in the process in the in the cell biology of it. So uh, the first time I saw your name, I think uh, I think was when that review article was published in in Jev uh, that you published discussing different pathway by which EVs could be taken up and yeah my brain melted right there and then because <laughs> there were so many alternative pathways right yeah, yeah and you look at the literature now uh there are a lot of um possible pathways that are being uh, explored and and suggested to be important so what do you how do you look at that i mean this is an important um thing to understand a mechanism to understand how do evs uh, mediate their effect in the recipient cell. We believe that they need to be taken up. We believe sometimes they need to deliver their cargo to a recipient cell in an efficient way. And and how do we how do we start understanding those processes, Dave? Hey, oh well, where do I start? Um, it's, yeah, I know it, it's difficult because it is. Huge. See, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it, it's it's it is it's a massive massive question, and it's it's a, also a massive problem. It, it's generally an understudied thing, right? So, so there's mm -hmm. several questions in there. So the first is, how do we, how do the EVs get in? And I think actually there's a previous question which maybe we could put in, which is, do they need to get in? And in some cases, sometimes they do, they do sometimes maybe not. Sometimes right. they do, sometimes they don't. So there is a question of how do most of them have their effects? Do most of the effects come from delivery of cargo, or do most of the effects come from just interactions on the cell surface between ligands and receptors? There's an argument to be made for potentially for either. Um, how do they get in? Well, there's lots of different pathways, as, as, as you said. 
and and which is the most important yeah i can tell you and, and i think it's actually a question it's also linked to ev heterogeneity because there are many different pathways through which evs can get in yeah and and it may be that different subpopulations of evs use different you know entry portals if you like into the cells it may be that specific types of evs go into specific doors um or maybe all EVs can go through all doors into the cell and through all those pathways. We, we just don't know because we don't have a handle on the heterogeneity, yeah. but that's, that's a whole other story. Yeah. I think the thing that we probably know the least about, I would argue, is, is how does that cargo get used? Mm -hmm. We know very little about how, how that cargo gets delivered. We know in principle that, the, that for example, the RNA can be delivered, that proteins mm -hmm. can be delivered, but into the cytoplasm, into an actual, that it can effectively be used. But how that happens, I think very little is known about that. How do they escape? Is it fusion at the cell surface? Is it, is it fusion at the yeah. endosomal compartment? Is there something else going on? We, we just don't know, right? we don't know. So that's a real black box. And I think that's something that's really interesting uh, to study. And that's one of the things we're hoping to, to get at with one of the projects that we're doing yeah. at the moment. Um, so just for the audience to clarify what we're, what we're saying, basically multiple different cells in the body can produce different types of vesicles. And that's basically uh, a unanswered question as well, which subpopulations this cell produces and which subpopulations this cell produces. And then these vesicles are released and they're taken up by the other cell perhaps, or perhaps by themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And 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 that could happen uh, through different pathways for the different subpopulations. And yeah. I, do you have a guess how many subpopulations we have? Do you have a suggestion how many we may have from uh, a single cell? But I think from a single cell you can get a lot of different subpopulations. I think it's really hard to tell because there's so many different endosomal compartments in there, and, and mm -hmm. there may be there almost certainly are and uh, yeah, specialized endosomal compartments, which mm -hmm. are for specific purposes. Um, I think that there's stress-related endosomal compartments that yeah. may be uh, waiting there, ready to be released, for example. But it's a very different question, how many specific kinds of, yeah. uh, you know, subpopulation. I would say that there's I don't know. a dozen, probably, but I mean, who Probably, knows? yeah. Yeah. So I, we just published last year on the mitochondrial inner membrane protein uh, enriched extracellular vesicles, which is a small subpopulation. But we found it interesting that it, it was there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's just, uh, and, and it still had some other canonical markers, right? Uh, and if you look, so those were, those were from certain cell types and from uh, human mast cell lines and from tissues and stuff like that, but not from HEC293 cells, for example. We could not find them in HEC293 cells. So different cells obviously produce different types of, of, uh, of subpopulations, and that's one important aspect. And then your question is, are they actually taken up by different pathways as, as well? Yeah. So uh, they may well be taken yeah. up by different pathways. I think some of the pathways are uh, some of the pathways are probably more restrictive than others. So, for example, certain endocytic pathways. Uh, like mm -hmm. pathway mediated endocytosis, perhaps caviole mediated endocytosis, they may be a little bit more specific, maybe, but then maybe uh, phagocytosis, which can be receptor mediated, of course, but, but right. phagocytosis and macropinocytosis, which so macropinocytosis is more like a, sometimes people call it cell drinking, it's like the membrane ruffles that form and then yeah. drag things in, um, and it, 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 that may be more just simply sampling what's on the cell surface without worrying too much about what it is. So, uh, and, yeah, and there is okay. some evidence, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I often think of the plasma membrane surface as a pretty, people think of it as this boring structure, but actually it's incredibly dynamic. And mm -hmm. I, I think of it as, as like, do you know the, the, the perfect storm, the film, the movie? With yes, the, of course. So, and, and a cross between that the and-, waves. and in, Exactly, and if you think about like Indiana Jones, and it's full of like trap doors and booby traps and and so it's just really incredibly <laughs> that's the cell all right yeah and 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 so yeah. the, the entire surface of the plasma membrane of a cell is replaced like every few hours it's, it's very dynamic uh, and so I, I think that that sampling of the surface is is, is ongoing and and there is some evidence there's a paper from 
think it's Peter Varda's lab that showed that uh, macropinocytosis, uh, macropinocytosis in particular is pretty important for EV uptakes. But again, um, if you inhibit any given pathway, you see a reduction in EV uptake generally, most cell types, most studies, uh, but not a complete reduction. And so that- Never a again, complete reduction, exactly. Never a complete, well, generally not. But, and and so, so that probably means that either you know, all, set, all EVs can then go through those different entry doors and entry pathways into the cell, or it means that a subpopulation of the EVs is no longer going into cells, but the rest of them can because- Through that, or it goes in through another pathway, all right, yeah, or you're right. blocking, yeah, gotcha, yeah. yeah. But we don't have enough of a handle on that because we don't have enough um, you know, markers for, for different subtypes. How, how good are the tools we're using for pharmacological blockers of certain uptake pathways as well? That's another issue, right? So, so a lot of the pharmacological, <laughs> well, no, it's all right. So a lot of those inhibitors are, are not completely specific. And so they, in, they inhibit different pathways. And sometimes that's because they may be inhibiting more than one protein. And in some cases it may be because they're inhibiting one protein, but that one protein is involved in different pathways. Redundant. So for example- Right, 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 use, exactly. Yeah, what manin, for example, will inhibit both um, uh, macropinocytosis and phagocytosis. Okay. And, and there's, there's, for example, dinosaur uh, is, is an inhibitor of dynamin 2, but that's involved in incision. As, as the membrane comes in and then is pinched off, um, there are precision proteins like dinosaur, which, uh, uh, like dynamin, that they're involved in, in pinching that off and, and breaking that. So, so if you inhibit those, you inhibit that process, but it's involved in lots of different parts of the cell, lots, lots of different processes. So it's not completely specific. Right. Yeah. And that makes it difficult. That makes it uh, exciting. It does make it exciting. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's it, it's a big challenge, and and any challenge, uh, it, you know, if it's the more difficult, it's the more uh, yeah. worth doing. That's what we're here for as scientists. We are Absolutely. to to feed our curiosity with uh, with new questions and try to answer Absolutely. them. So, Absolutely. and the other, if you take it to another level and and, and think about which cells in general take up vesicles. We do have these professional EV eaters, uh, macrophages yeah. obviously, dendritic cells, and, and they're uh, basically designed to chew up extracellular vesicles in seams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cooper cells in the liver. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's it does, I, I don't want to be uh, too too uh, controversial, but it does make you wonder sometimes if if EV mediated transfer is a, a you know generally a phenomenon because if you inject them into EV if you inject EVs into mice for example or into uh, other organisms they most of them go in the liver into macrophages into Kupfer cells and they're got rid of really so quickly and so it seems that the main Uptakers, if you like, I know if that's a word, but uptakers of, of EVs are these macrophages. So, and 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 yeah, they're, they're involved yeah. in, in getting rid of particulate matter from from the from from the body. So, yeah, I, it's 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 a tricky one. But here's an interesting thing. So, um, so what you're talking about with selectivity. So there has been some nice work, for example, in, in zebrafish. So Jackie Gertz and uh, Guillaume Vanille have got some really nice papers showing transfer of, of EVs within zebrafish. And one of the things that has been shown uh, is it, within that body of work is that you can get EVs released into the bloodstream and very, very abundantly. And, and you can get them going into macrophages, also endothelial cells. Um, and, and but actually, even though that the muscle cells, for example, are bathed, completely coated and smothered in these vesicles, they very, very rarely, if ever, go into the muscle mm -hmm. cells. So there is a degree of specificity. Whatever that, whether the specificity comes from the protein markers on the vesicles or the, the specific endocytic activity of the recipient cells, right. it, it's hard to know for sure. But, but there are in vivo experiments now that are starting to pick out some of that. You know some of those questions. Yes, yeah. but I mean, but it clearly, it would be wonderful if we could design a vesicle to go specifically into um, gut or muscle cells, right? That would be very nice indeed. And uh, yeah, if you, but it's not that easy. No, it's not. It's not that easy at all. And I think you know certain cell types in particular, I think, are very, very difficult to target. You know, if you put EVs into into organisms, into, like into a mouse. As I said, mm -hmm. most of it goes to the liver and spleen, um, and and you don't tend to be able to target certain cell types very easily. Mm -hmm. This is not so much my field, but um, 
But I know that during, for example, inflammation, uh, you will see increased uptake of EV. So there are obviously changes during inflammation, for example, during uh, an infarct in heart, for example, during right. brain inflammation, and also in tumors. I mean, in tumors, tumors is probably a slightly different case because they are, you know, the, 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 the blood vessels are quite thin. Endothelium is damaged, yeah, exactly. It's a bit messed up. So, so you get a lot of leakiness there. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of uh, understanding that uh, biodistribution and where they go, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a big topic. And then obviously there are, there are lots of labs trying to understand how can we tinker with that. And I think that's, yeah. that's a really important thing yeah. because if we can tinker with it, which I think we can, then we can potentially send these vesicles to different places. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that you can send them easily through an intact no. endothelium, right? Because no. Even if you can do that with phage uh, display techniques or phage technologies and find some specific trafficking, it's very difficult to do with an extracellular vesicle or, or, or so. so. So there's more research that needs to be done to achieve that in the future. But it's absolutely clear, as you say, to me that if you have inflammation, if you have a trauma, mm -hmm. you, you will get vesicles to that, even if you in inject them intravenously. The other way to think about, I mean, I, I am quite passionate about therapeutics. I'm, I, I'm not going to drag you into that uh, debate too bit deeply, but but uh, you can also consider delivering vesicles through other routes of administration, right? Deliver them yeah. by local therapy, topical therapy, eye drops, uh, injection into the brain, what have you, uh, to yeah. to uh, reduce those um, issues that the barriers provide for for um, treating those complicated diseases so completely i don't know you can you can put them into you know like these hydrogels and things like that and then you can get slow exactly. delivery over time i mean that's also true how that's yeah effect, how that's affecting stability of the evs but mm -hmm. um but but yeah there's all sorts of different ways and i think it's an exciting time as a and and that's what you're saying about inflammation as well the other thing about that is that is that it's not just about injecting EVs into a body and seeing that, oh yeah, look, they go to sites of inflammation. I, I think that that tells us something really important, which is that EVs in that context, that plays, I think, an important role in, mm -hmm. in resolving or, or, or you know, being involved in the biology of those inflammatory responses. Um, but I think there's a lot of exciting work that's gonna be, that's gonna come in the next few years related to the therapeutic potential of EV. I think it's, you know, I don't mind being dragged into this. I think it's a really exciting area. So uh, where, where, where do you see yourself? Uh, which line of work do you see yourself uh, uh, travel along in with the next few years in the EV field? Because you're obviously staying around. You're not giving up on EVs so. as yet, right? No, 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 I'm not giving up at all. I, I, so my, my main area I think is, is, Okay, two things. The first is continuing the, the, the three things, um, four things. Um, so one is uh, the, the, the stress response stuff. I want, to, I want to push on that a bit more, but I'm really interested in the uptake. And because and, the thing about the uptake, understanding uptake better and understanding how that cargo is delivered is that right. if you can understand that better, you, you can then hopefully help therapeutically because you can you know, if you understand that a certain protein in the endosomal compartment, for example, is helping EVs to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be utilized uh, effectively, then you can potentially alter your EV to, to encourage its cargo delivery. Um, so, so that's an area which we're particularly interested in. But I think, I think the, the tumor, how they're affecting tumors in particular is also something that we're really focusing on at the moment. Uh, and uh, in vivo, using in vivo models to try and understand that transfer. Uh, we've also got into uh, EV loading recently, and uh, and particularly during stress response, and how how vesicles are loaded, and how that changes during stress mm -hmm. response, and, and how that ultimately affects the phenotype and function of the, uh, of the EV. But one of the things I particularly like about this field is the fact that you can, because it, it, it's still, I still think of it as relatively early stage. I know it's. I don't know yeah, at what point of course, you can I agree. say that it's that it's not, but um, but I particularly like doing uh, cross disciplinary work. So I'm working with some engineers and and, and people in the AI to try and develop. Uh, as I said, I got into to, to uh, biomarkers now, and so I particularly like working with people from different disciplines to try and develop mm -hmm. novel 
approaches and, and other technologies. So that's something that uh, is of interest. But yeah, so my 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 goal is to try and stay to some extent focused on uh, on on uh, not becoming too much of a scattergun and, and stay focused. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I definitely want to stay in the EV field. Yeah, so I mean, the, the the one thing I try to encourage people to do is to follow data. Yeah, absolutely. So to believe your data, follow it. Try to improve on on the models you're using. And and you know, twenty years ago, I had no idea what Nexosome was. I was an aller translational allergy and clinical allergy researcher, and then <laughs> we stumbled on exosomes. And uh, and as long as you if you're a true curious scientist, you'll you will see what is good data, and you will see what is novel, and you can take that path. And and, and that's uh, so you're working a lot with uh, with uptake pathways now, and, and you see a lot of hurdles and issues with uh, with the techniques that we have available today. Oh yeah, so um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? Um, oh, yes, you, you're scratching issues. your head now. You're scratching yeah, your yeah. head. <laughs> we, there are issues. Absolutely, there are issues. And and yeah. this is something that has is a source of frustration. It really is a source of frustration because you know it's something that we've been working at for a few years now, and and a lot of this we've tried to produce. And I, I'm, I'm not going to get into specifics here, but we've tried to reproduce certain experiments. And we haven't been able to. And part of that has been because of the issues with the technology, with the methodology. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing a lot of experiments to actually try and optimize. We've done a lot of optimizing, a lot of trying to figure out the methodology. And <clears throat> this is some some work, a few papers that we're about to uh, submit. Um, but it's it's been very frustrating because it's made me feel like a lot of the stuff that's in the literature, and again, I don't want to get too much into specifics, could be not as accurate, let's say, as it could be, because because there's uh, there's issues with the methodology that we're all using, and so <clears throat> we're trying to we're trying to get that optimized, and then we'll be in a better position to uh, to to study the uptake pathways more easily. <clears throat> so when you when you speak with when you speak with EV researchers uh, uh, that are really trying to understand. <clears throat> uptake mechanisms. A lot of them are trying lipid dyes, basically dyes that are supposed to go into into membranes. And we've done that. Um, and, and but it's also clear, we've known for quite a long time now that you these dyes by themselves can create vesicle like structures and particles. Yeah. Uh, and and that's clearly one issue that you have to do you see a way of avoiding that or is there any dye that is less uh, prone to do that than another dye? Or am um, I going too much into specifics when I ask no, that? No, that's okay. Um, we are moving away from dyes now because we've tried quite okay. a lot of different dyes. And, and I, I want to be careful what I say here. So, um, so we haven't found many dyes that don't have issues. Mm -hmm. And we are coming to the conclusion that Maybe that we haven't tried the right dye, and I'm not saying which dyes mm -hmm. we've tried yet. We'll, we'll we'll send some papers out soon, and, and mm -hmm. uh, there for people to see. But but we've we tried a bunch of different dyes, and they don't seem to work brilliantly. They're not labeling the vesicles particularly well, and and they are forming lots of structures which shouldn't be there. So mm -hmm. they're forming micelles, and then as you say, vesicle-like structures, which when you have a no EV control. And, and have some dye, they're forming to these structures which are then getting into cells. Now, I have seen some papers where they've included the no dye control, but, sorry, the no EV control, and, and they, they don't see uptake, and fair enough. In our hands, mm -hmm. we see it quite often. And so mm -hmm. we are, as I said, moving away from using those dyes. Um, and so it, it is, a, as I said, it's a source of frustration. So if you do a very careful um... Uh, flotation <clears throat> approach to mm -hmm. separate. Yes. Do, are these are these so light yes. as, as as light as they they would be on top of the of the uh, of the uh, um, of the opti prep or whatever you're using, and the vesicles yeah. would be below them. Yeah. Is that so a possible way of doing that. it? Yeah. 
Yeah, and you can. So that has been shown. So, so there was a, a paper recently from Michelinasi's group, and, uh, and, she, and she showed that, yeah, you, you, you can separate the unbound dye that, that forms my cells using flotation gradient, um, which I think that is probably the best way to do it in the end, um, is to actually put it through a flotation gradient. But um, uh, it's just very, very time consuming. And if you want to do any sort of high throughput experiments, then that's it becomes difficult. So we were looking to do some screens for EV uptake, and mm -hmm. that just it became. Much and then obviously you can engineer the cells to produce vesicles that are fluorescent. That's been done for several years now by different groups. And yeah, the thing is, of course, when the cells are taken up those vesicles, they may pro might process the the protein that is fluorescent, for example, and degrade yeah. it, and um, that might be an issue. So there are. There are Absolutely. many dynamic steps that are, are, think, are happening here. So one thing I wanted to touch on a little bit, and people don't speak about this much, is, is nuclear traffic of uh, vesicles, the uptake basically. And, and you can see these fluorescent uh, vesicles in the nucleus um, quite quickly. Aurelio Lorico in, in uh, Las Vegas actually published a paper, I think a year ago or something like that. Where, where they describe the mechanisms by which uh, this can happen. And it's clearly not, you know, you look at uptake, it's not the majority of vesicles, but some do. And mm. have you seen that as well in your, in your experiments? <clears throat> uh, we haven't particularly. It's not something okay. that we've ever noticed uh, them getting into the nucleus. You see them like perinuclear, you know, they're on the periphery there, and, but right. we don't see them, we've never seen them going in particularly. But to be honest, we haven't looked that hard. So it is possible that they're getting in mm -hmm. there. Um, and we're just not seeing them. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't necessarily rule it out. I think there is something interesting going on with um, with the nucleus. I think there is some kind of trafficking that's going on. And, and you know, we were talking before um, about um, about mitochondria as well. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of traffic, I think, that's going on between these different organelles in the outside world right. through the release of vesicles. And, and I, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there is two-way communication with nucleus. but in answer to your question, no, we, we haven't seen it. But what's in, what I always find interesting about our uptake experiments is that, I, I, I guess other people find the same, I don't know, but we often find that some cells in our, say, 70% confluent layer or whatever mm -hmm. it might be, some cells have taken up lots and lots of vesicles. And, and some, some not at all. Any. Oh, no, and of course, yeah, yeah. Them, yeah, that's yeah, true. And you, and, and it's, you'll see them as like these individual here and there, and you know you'll see that. And, and often I think that what you see in the in the paper when you when you're reading a paper on EV uptake, you'll see a representative yeah. image. It's probably the one that had the, the the tons of. But we we see it's very heterogeneous, and I don't know what right. the cause of that is, why some cells take up so many. And is we've looked at like position. It's not necessarily the one on the edge. It's not necessarily the one that's on the top. It's not you know it's, it, it seems to be a little bit. Um, Random as to which Could one single is. cell analysis help us understand that? I, I yeah, that's something we would like to do. We've we've started doing mm -hmm. a couple of experiments with that, but yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it'd be nice to find so, out the, if there is a significant yeah. between these. Of course, you've got to then resolve whether or not it's if it's single cell effects that are caused by the vesicles or that are allowing mm -hmm. the vesicles to be taken up. So you're working a little bit with cancer. You mentioned breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Uh, um, and and how do you how do you see your work on um, uptake and stress, uh, EV mediated stress signaling, I guess, between cells? How do you see that um, teaching us about those tumors? In what sense? In 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 the sense functional functionally or or biologically, how do you how do you think you could uh, learn more about the tumor that's mm -hmm. and how those cancers and those cancer cells? That's that's fundamental. Just understanding yeah. them is fundamental. But then understanding that, then of course, then you can start thinking about you know diagnostics or therapeutics mm -hmm. approaches to try to influence that. So. Yeah, so I think that's where we're at the moment, and and so we are trying to understand how are these cells responding to to stress. Now we all of our work, well most of our work has been in vitro using cell lines, mm -hmm. which obviously is, is a step 
several steps removed from, from the real tumor. <clears throat> but we hope that by understanding how they are communicating in that, even, even though it's a 2D cell culture model, how are they communi communicating using <clears throat> EVs, mm -hmm. particularly under stress response, and, and, and how that affects then the behavior of those cells? Because we've seen several different things. We see that when, when the cells become stressed, the EVs that they release are different. They contain different components. They also seem to be smaller. So when you do EM on them, they physically appear to be smaller. And again, we don't know what, quite what that means yet. Um, um, but, but then what we're seeing is that those EVs have several functional properties that are different. They can, as I've said, they can induce stress in recipient cells. They can induce um, uh, stress response and also an adaptive response in recipient cells. But they also seem to induce increased invasion and metastatic ability. So all of these things, if translated to the real tumor in, in vivo, mm -hmm. can potentially then imply that there is this complex behavior going on which could induce or assist in tumor evolution and tumor, or perhaps not evolution, but tumor progression. Mm. Um, so what exactly is going on in vivo? That's a more difficult question. And obviously that's where you need more complex uh, models to try and tease that apart. And then of course, you've right. also got the added complication of the, um, of the tumor marker environment, which plays an important role. Immune uh, system, vasculature. Immune system, yeah. cancer associated platelets, all kinds of things, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a becomes a much much more complex picture. So so what we're trying to hopefully find out from what we're doing is is a basic part that we then hope to be able to um, see if we can how much of that we can extrapolate in vivo. We know the bystander effect occurs in vivo, but but mm -hmm. how many of the bystander specific uh, features occur? And that's something that we need to figure out. I think the other thing as well is that I think fundamentally, in terms of the way that we and, and a lot of people are doing our experiments, I think that needs looking at as well. Because when we do experiments in vitro, right, we, we, we purify a load of EVs, and then we have our cells growing in a dish, and then we take a load of EVs and plonk them on top, and then we see what happens. We, we see if the cells have become more metastatic or if the angiogenesis has been induced. Mm -hmm. um, but quite often, the doses that we're using are, are like a massive dose in a short period of time. But that's not, I don't, I don't think that's how EVs work in real life. In vivo, that's not, I don't think, how they work. You don't get a sudden massive local, massive, massive local release. Well, you could um, in, in apoptosis and necrotic situations, right? A lot of vesicles happening, right? But on the scale but that we do them in vitro in these kind of I don't, I don't know, but, but I, I think you're making a very good point is that our, our scientific methods are designed for our students to get data quickly. Yeah. Exactly. Right? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly. I'm what sorry it is. to be cynical, all students no, around no, the world, no, but, you, it's, but it's, uh, not, it's also postdocs, and and it, it's 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 not. It, you're absolutely right. It's because we want to see an effect. We want to see an right. effect. So we we use a large dose <clears throat> in a short period of time, and then we see something. I think the way that we're more likely to see real result, like like what's more perhaps in vivo representative, is is this slower drip drip feed. Of an EV, right. I think over a course of days or weeks or months, then you will start to see a change. Or for life, you'll start to see yeah. a change in the phenotype, which is significant and, and meaningful and, and has a real world, you know, like physiological role. And we're trying to recreate that in a dish with a short, like, time frame, as you we're say, exactly. so that the student can get yeah. a result. So, and 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 I mean, for our for our experiments, we've also seen you do see dose different the dose dependent effects. Quite often, you have to use a massive dose before you see anything. You're right. It's the same with the transfers, with the uptake experiments. Quite often, you have to use a massive dose to see something. So, so there is a, and I, again, I don't want to poo-poo the field at all, but I, there is a question mark in my mind hanging over it, which is no, um, no. I mean, we're questioning our our own work in a way, but we have to, and we have to understand which limitations we we uh, have put on ourselves in understanding the, the breadth and the width and the uh, time course of EV function uh, throughout time. For example, I mean, you can clearly see very rapid phosphorylation cascades being induced by extracellular vesicles. If you use bacterial vesicles, they are very rapidly activating TLR receptors or 
Uh, if you use inflammatory cell, we've worked a lot with mast cells. They have TGF beta on their surface. They bang, you get phosphorylation yeah. within minutes, actually. And of course, that's it took a long time to get that paper together, five years or more. But but it's it's um, it's it's easier in a way to look at those uh, methods because they give you an answer. You can measure it easily. Whereas you know, I, I I believe that RNA, for example, shuttling with RNA is important, but it's m actually much more difficult to study. We we published something, and and you know we're famous for our exosome and RNA paper back in seven. But if you want to understand physiology and uh, how these vesicles are important in homeostasis, you have to have experiments or think about processes that are much slower than those experiments. Actually, we can design experiments in vitro in, those, in, in, in that perspective. So we need to some fancy mouse models probably to, to try to understand that. So. Yeah, it's, it, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I, I wouldn't suggest that, that our experiments, that we shouldn't be doing them because they are the best proxy that we have for what might be going mm -hmm. on. Obviously, we have to understand the limitations. And, and I think that just because we see it in a study like this, where it's mm -hmm. like a high dose of EVs and we see an effect, it doesn't necessarily, I'm not suggesting that it doesn't mean something and it doesn't, it doesn't have value and impact. Um, right. But we just have to be aware of what those limitations are and that in, in real life, the effects are much much slower, and I agree with you. By the way, about um, RNA transfer being much more difficult to to, to study, it is very it's much difficult. difficult. Yeah, you, and you can get a lot of you can eliminate the RNA and get still get rapid biological functions. So a lot of those rapid biological functions are unlikely to be mediated by the RNA, whereas some functions. I mean, definitely you have an effect of the RNA. You can load with certain RNA structures and siRNAs, and you can get a biological effect in the recipient cell, albeit not as much as you might have wanted to, but you, you get something happening. So, so there's clearly um, something, there's a there there, as some people say, yeah. there's something uh, important happening. So, yeah, so, so if you look into the future, I mean, you write grants, right? And you write grants that are three or four years long, but if you look beyond that, if you look at your next grants and five or ten year perspective, where do you think the field will be? Where will you be? And and uh, what's your what's your vision or perspective so, on uh, that? Yeah, so I um, I don't know. I don't know is, is the honest answer. But but I yeah. I feel that the and again I don't want to be too controversial, but I sort of feel like the the EV field is still a little bit like the Wild West. I think we're in the Wild West, and, and I think everyone's doing their own thing, everyone's doing their own techniques, and, and there's a lot of methodology that we don't really understand, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't really work, and, and it works in some people's hands, but not other people's hands, and there's mm -hmm. technology that needs to be improved, and, and I think it's, it's starting to come together. I feel like it's starting to get better. So, so with ISEV and, and other organizations that are trying to bring a little bit of order and trying to a bit of, a bit of standardization that you can track and things like this are really, really important and have helped to bring focus. And so I still feel like it's a little bit like the Wild West, but it's definitely getting better. Where will we be in, let's say, 10 years time? I feel like we'll be in a much more solid place, I think. I think the foundations will have been shored up and, and, and I think that our methodology will be much improved. And I think these are key. I, you know, I could talk about, we'll have a better understanding of EV heterogeneity. We could have a better understanding right. of EV cargo delivery. It would be all about therapeutics and diagnostics. But I think for me, the, the biggest challenge is just getting the methodology right. And, and I mm. think if we can get the methodology better and more solid, then the whole field will be in a better position. And so I'd like to think that we'll, we probably won't be quite there, but I think if we're in a better place with the methodology, then that will be a really good place to be. Um, and then, of course, yeah, sure. Then, then we've got the, the therapeutics and the diagnostics, and, and I do think we'll start to see more applications, more um, the, the kind of realization of the benefits of the basic understanding. I mean, in reality, there's still many, many way. You know, clinical trials take a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, get diagnostics, genuine working diagnostics that will take time. But you know, in ten years' time, we may start to see some of those coming through. Um, but I'd settle for a solid, 
solid methodology, methodology. for the field. And, and having I, I, a field where we're, we're yeah. more or less in agreement with what works and what doesn't. I mean, we'll, we'll, never, we'll never all be able to agree on that, of course, but, um, but, but having a bit more consensus on it. The way the way I so I ISEV has really helped me to improve my technologies or our technologies in our lab, mm -hmm. and, and the generosity by which people share their experiences over the last, over the first few years of ISEV, conceived in two thousand eleven, it's nine years ago now, yeah. um, has been very important for the whole field. And, and the MISEV guidelines are are helpful and they're a good foundation, and people should read those. They should yeah. probably try to develop technologies that are even better than those. Uh, to, to understand it. But I also compare uh, our field sometimes with immunology. If I remember in the 1990s, uh, perhaps, we knew about CD4 cells and CD8 cells, so that's about it, right? Yeah. T uh, helper cells and T suppressor cells, and uh, the, the explosion of new subsets of T lymphocytes and other types of, of immune cells has, has really taught us a lot over the over the last few decades. And we have so much more to discover and more, much more to, to learn about EVs in a similar way as, as, uh, as immunology has been, has been doing. But, but then again, you, I'm humbled as well. We have to realize that understanding uh, of the depth of extracellular vesicles will evolve certainly beyond my lifetime, right? And, and possibly before, beyond your lifetime. And, and uh, uh, there'll, be, there'll be a lot of interesting stuff to, to study for many years to come. So I encourage sure. students to go for it because it's, I, it's fun, exciting, it's a nice community to work in. It's, do you know what, can I, can I just say, I think that, that what you just said just right in there, absolutely, I, I found the EV community to be absolutely amazing and, and really, really nice and positive and friendly and helpful and collaborative and, and it's just been a really nice field to work in. Now, yeah. I think part of that is because it's a new field and there's an element of, of camaraderie that we've all got into this field together right. and, and, and so I think... We struggled, we all struggled, right? We're struggling together to, to, to mm -hmm. get the, you know, to get the EV field on a, on a, on a decent footing in terms of methodology, but also in terms of acceptance. Because, you know, I have colleagues who, who look at me and say, you know, are these EVs really real? I mean, so of course I, yeah. I, I laugh, at, but, but there are people who still question a lot of our field. And, and so, so I think that, that it is gaining more acceptance. And I think that right. as we move forward, that will, um, you know that we'll we'll be in a much stronger position, I think. Yeah, and and I agree with you about the um, about the heterogeneity as well. And where the, the, I, I've heard Clotilde Thierry also give that same analogy about yeah. the immunology field and, and different right. subsets of, of EVs. And and I, I agree. It's, I think it's really trying to understand that heterogeneity is going to be super exciting. And I've heard some people saying that um, that we understand EV biogenesis now. Whereas it's other things that we don't understand. I am not. I, I'm not sure. I agree. I think that we just we don't know that much still, and mm -hmm. we know a lot more. Of course we do, but there's so much to discover, and and it is a really exciting field to get into. It's hard. The, the, the methodology is hard, and, and working with EVs is challenging. But but it's yeah, it's worth it. It's, it's virgin territory. It's virgin, you know, virgin territory. It's, it's <laughs> super exciting. I think that's a perfect way to uh, to end this uh, podcast. So thank you very much, Dave. It was it's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for thank taking you. the time, and thank you everyone for for listening. And uh, there will be plenty more to come. And and stay tuned. And I see you soon. Bye.